session number six, Apologetics, uh, Worldviews in Perspective, the Big Picture. What I want to do this, this time is I kind of want to step back and look at everything that we've learned. We learned, you know, what is a worldview? How would you define a worldview? Somebody just take a shot at it. What non-Christian non-believers believe. Okay, what non-believers believe. Um, could, but is there a Christian worldview? Okay. What, does everybody have a worldview? Sometimes it might be a blender. You know, they might have a couple, you know, a little bit of uh, secularism, a little bit of moralistic therapeutic theism, a little bit of whatever. But everybody has a worldview, and really a worldview is, is a story we tell about why things are the way they are. It's really the answer that we give to really big questions, like, why am I here? What's the purpose of life? Where am I going? What's the problem? What's the solution? Everybody has a worldview, whether they know it or not. Sometimes as a culture, we have this kind of shared worldview, that these things that we assume to be true. And the thing with worldviews is they're typically not based on evidence. Uh, they're just things that we kind of assume about what is or what isn't, often without even thinking about it. Now, there is a Christian worldview, uh, and, and the nice thing about the Christian worldview is there is a lot of evidence. We talked about that. Uh, two weeks ago, we talked about, or rather three weeks ago, we talked about science. We talked about how these things point to a creator and how atheism or the secular worldview does not answer a lot of those questions about how things got here and why they are the way they are. It doesn't answer those very well. Uh, we also talked about the evidence for the resurrection last week. There's a, a lot of evidence so that really the burden of proof is laid upon the secular worldview to explain uh, why the early Christians believed what they did believe about the resurrection of Jesus. Now, uh, what I want to do this time is I want to step back and just take a look at all the worldviews we've looked at. Christian faith, moralistic therapeutic deism, and secularism, and I want us to look at this as sort of like a story, because uh, that's really what worldviews are, is they're stories, stories that we tell, stories we believe. Now, how would you define moralistic therapeutic deism? Just give me some thoughts on this. If somebody came up to you and said, what is moralistic therapeutic deism, what would you say? Yeah. God-like. God-like, right? And expound on that a little bit more. Like he's only what you want to be, not who he is. He's what you want him to be. Yeah, he's a God made in your own image, right? Yeah. What else? Okay. Moralistic therapeutic deism. Yeah. He's only in your life when you need him. Yeah, he's, he's on call, right? He's not going to bother you or tell you to do anything. He has no expectations. It's just that if you get into a bind, if you have a problem, or you have some goal or dream you want to accomplish, you can call God in and he'll come in and help you. Maybe. Uh, what else? Anything else to add to moralistic therapeutic deism? Go ahead, Anne. Um, the purpose of life is to be happy. Yeah, right. The purpose of life is not to glorify God. The purpose of life is to be happy. And even if we as Christians would say the purpose of life is to be happy in God, the moralistic therapeutic deism worldview would be the purpose of life is to be happy on my own terms. Oh, God is whatever you want him to be. Yeah, he's, yeah I mean, just... I mean, if you want God to be, you know, kind of a nice grandfatherly Santa, Fa Santa Claus kind of guy, you know, that's cool. Uh, when you wish upon a, a star, it's kind of like that. Okay, so uh, how about the secular worldview? Let's take that apart a little bit. What do you think about that? How would you define secularism? Kind of as like a... <clears throat> You know, everything your your own goals are more important than other things. Sort of like a me centered. Belief. It's me centered, right? Now, now moralistic therapeutic deism is me centered, but but does secularism allow for God? No. So uh, yeah, secularism is kind of like no God allowed. It's it's there is no God. We're all here by chance. If you believe in truth or meaning, which there really aren't such things. It's, it's all based on your opinion. It's not a fact, it's just an opinion. Um, so, let's talk about this for a minute. Let's look at our study, guys. What makes for a good story? Well, the stories have some key elements, right? So number one, in a story, you're gonna have characters, right? 
I mean, a story would be pretty boring if you didn't have any characters. Number two, you're going to have the purpose of the characters. What, why are the, the characters in the story? What, what are they doing? What's their purpose? Number three, the characters are going to face problems. That's what makes every story interesting, right? I mean, think about any movie that you've watched recently. Isn't there usually a problem? That's part of the plot. It makes it interesting. We love stories because in the story, there's a problem, and you're wondering, how is this problem going to get solved? And so number four, a good story has the solutions encountered. Now let's tie that into worldview, because really, worldview is all about story. So when we're talking about characters, we're really asking the question, who am I? What does it mean to be me? What does it mean to be a human? Number two, uh, the purpose of the characters is really tied to that question of why am I here? What's the purpose of being human? Why do I exist? Then number three, the problems that the characters face is really the question, well, what's wrong with the world? See how this plugs into basic worldview questions? And then number four, the solutions that, that we encounter tie into the question, what brings us back to good? What gets us back to a good spot? Let's try this out quick. Let's just take a few moments and maybe you can work yourself or with a partner, but uh, think about these two characters, very different characters, right? Mm -hmm. How would each of these characters answer the question, who am I, why am I here, what's wrong with the world or the galaxy rather, and uh, what's the solution? So if you see that little chart down there, just run through and answer these questions quick. How would Darth Vader answer the question, who am I? How would Luke Skywalker answer the same question? As well as, why am I here? What's, the, what's wrong with the world or the galaxy? And what's the solution? All right, if you were Darth Vader and you're operating from the evil empire worldview or galaxy view, I don't know, how would you answer the question, who am I? A Sith Lord. A Sith Lord, yes. Which has all kinds of connotations to it. Yeah. How would Luke Skywalker answer the same question? Jedi, right? I'm a Jedi Knight. Yeah. Also, son of the evil Sith Lord, but that's a surprise for later. Identity crisis. Uh, how about Darth Vader? How would he say? How would he answer the question, "Why am I here?" Yeah. To bring peace and security to the galaxy. Oh, okay. To bring peace and security to the galaxy, of course, on his terms. What about in relationship to the Rebel Alliance? What would his purpose be? Conquering. To destroy. To destroy, yes, to conquer and destroy. To stop the Rebel Alliance. I can't do a very good Darth Vader voice. I'm not going to try. How about Luke Skywalker? How would he answer that question differently? Why does he exist? Why is he here? Yeah. To get rid of the Empire and restore balance, of course. Okay, to get rid of the Empire, to bring the Empire down find its weak point, whether that be the Death Star or where else, and to bring down the evil empire and restore balance to the Force. Okay, what's wrong with the world, or rather the galaxy, according to Darth Vader? What's wrong? There's Jedi's. 
there's too many Jedi's or there's too many. There's too many Jedi's? They fall. They fall alliance. The Rebel Alliance. Not everyone will submit to the Empire. Oh, okay, not everybody will submit to the Empire. Now, conversely, what would Luke Skywalker and his Rebel Alliance say is wrong with the galaxy? The Empire. The Empire. They have very opposing worldview here. And what's the solution according to Darth Vader? It's all out war. War. Conquer. Blow up planets. How about uh, Luke Skywalker? Probably has something to do with taking out Darth Vader. But uh, you see how the same questions are answered differently depending upon one's worldview, and that's all about a story. A story about who we are, why we're here, where we're going, what's the purpose, what's the solution. Um, and it's the same with worldview. I'm going to pause for just a moment. I want to watch a short video. This is from uh, the Veritas Forum. The Veritas Forum started at Har Harvard, and it was a, it's a group of Christians that host debates, debates between atheists and uh, Christians uh, on intellectual questions. Uh, what we're going to see in this video is uh, N.T. Wright. He's a New Testament scholar. He's going to talk about, well, in, in a very short explanation, what is the Christian story? And then uh, there's a, a philosopher uh, from Yale who's going to talk about what is the secular story. And you'll just kind of see, c compare these side by side. I thought it'd be good for you just to hear somebody who is thoroughly secular in their philosophy to just kind of explain what they believe about the universe. Uh, so that's what we'll do. So think about this in terms of story as we watch it. Yeah, we got to do this again, don't we? I, when I say I believe in God, which I do, I know that the word God means different things to different people. And I believe in the God who I see revealed in Jesus and who I know is present powerfully in the personal presence that Christians call the Holy Spirit. So that's a very traditional Christian thing to say, but I think the more I look at Jesus, the more I discover about who God actually is. So it isn't a matter of first believing in God and then adding Jesus or the Spirit onto that. It's a matter of constantly being challenged by this amazing person called Jesus and all that he was, all that he did, and what happened to him, particularly his death and resurrection. And that forms the center, really, of everything else for me. It colors everything I believe about life, about who I am, about what it means to be uh, part of a family, what it means to be a teacher, what it means to be a citizen of a country, what it means to think about world issues. It, it's the center of all that I've tried to do. So um, that's probably pretty, pretty basic. Um, minute and a half, was that? Something like that? <laughs> You've got it. Professor Kagan, same question for you. Oh, good. Now I'll take longer since you did. Yeah, feel free. <laughs> yeah, I happily give you my extra minute. Yeah. So, so I'm not generally in the habit of trying to boil down my deepest beliefs into a, a handful of, of remarks either. And I found myself uh, a little uh, taken back at the request to do it. So here's my best attempt, but I'm not confident that it wouldn't come out different uh, if you were asking me again a week from now. Um, so so here's, here's where I want to, want, want to start. When, when I look at the universe, it seems to me that it's a place of uh, breathtaking beauty. Uh, and awe-inspiring complexity, and this can, as a result, be a source of deep, pervasive uh, joy, pleasure, satisfaction. But it also seems to me, sadly enough, that the universe is utterly, utterly indifferent to uh, us, uh, to not just to humans, but to other sentient creatures at all. It just doesn't care about uh, how it crushes us. It doesn't care about uh, the suffering, misery uh, that it causes us. It doesn't care about the fact that it cuts us down and tramples on our dreams. 
Um, more horrifyingly still, it's not just nature uh, that often has this attitude. Uh, we have this attitude to one another. Uh, other humans uh, call, are indifferent to the suffering of their fellow humans, or even worse, contribute in a malicious, vindictive, sadistic fashion to compounding the misery. Given all of this, uh, what can we do? Well, we can try to fight back. We can try to replace uh, ignorance with knowledge, uh, intolerance with tolerance, uh, subjugation with, uh, 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 with justice. Um, we can try to create lives for ourselves that have uh, uh, pleasure and joy and love and knowledge and accomplishment, and we can try to produce these things for other, help other people attain these things as well. An, an image that uh, doesn't often come to mind, but sometimes comes to mind when I think about questions like this, is I, I view the universe as a very dark and bleak place. Um, but it's not all dark. The, dark, the blackness is uh, not immutable. Uh, we can, if we gain love, then that creates a, a speck of light. Um, if we uh, gain some insight, that's a speck of light. If we join with another, maybe that make the speck grows into an island. And if we form a community, then with luck, the, the, the speck becomes a, a continent. Um, it's not a particularly optimistic picture because we're not going to ever overcome the, the darkness, um, but we can push back. Uh, and so what we should do with our life is to try to make things better. All right, so um, get out of here. So I thought that was just interesting because that allows us to see um, something we know already, which is the Christian worldview, shared very briefly by N.T. Wright, and then also something that maybe we're not as familiar with, and that is the, the secular worldview. We experience the effects of the secular worldview every day in school and work in, in just normal everyday culture. Uh, but I thought it'd be helpful for you just to hear from a secular philosopher um, what he believes about the world. So uh, any comments or questions or thoughts kind of about what was shared there? Did you kind of see the difference between the two stories? If you could sum up the secular story that was shared in one word, what would it be? Depressing. Depressing? Pessimistic. Pessimistic. Not much hope. I appreciated how honest he was because a lot of times people who hold on to the secular worldview are not going to be that honest about, well, you know, the universe is a pretty bleak place and there's really not a lot of hope and eventually, you know, the darkness will overtake us. And uh, I know, I think it's funny if you look at it. He's talking about Satan and God without mm -hmm. saying Satan and God. Yeah, and it's interesting to talk about the category of evil admits that there is a, an ideal good. Right. It's almost like how C.S. Lewis, you know, talks about you have God imprinted on you, but you just don't want to recognize that you have it. And it, to me, when I listened to him, I was like, you're talking about good and evil, like Satan and God, but you're not, you're not admitting that's, that's what it is. It's like he's yeah. telling the Christian viewpoint without allowing God to be into it. If, you know, the way I read him. That, that's a good point. And, and because even though somebody doesn't believe in God, we all live in God's world. And if you don't believe in God, but you live in God's world, you experience the reality of living in God's world and sometimes the painful reality of living in a world that's broken. And so that's why I, I really enjoy listening to secular music for one reason, is that secular music um, does a great job of narrating or telling the story of what's wrong with the world. Now some, you know, I'm not really into like, you know, death metal or something like that because it's pretty morbid, you know. But I'm talking about just whatever you hear on the radio, it is going to give you a good description of what's wrong with the world. It's really a cry out of something's broke. How do we get it fixed? Now idolatry is typically the way that we try to fix things. We tr find a god, money, sex, pleasure, success, whatever, and we try to fill the void fix what only God can fix. Let's take a look here at the Christian worldview. 
uh, in light of stories, if you got your study guide. We're going to run through this briefly. Uh, let's look at the, the question of uh, stories and worldviews according to Luther's small catechism. Now remember the Bible is a big book, but Luther's small catechism gives us like the bullet points of what it means to be a Christian and what the message of the Bible is. And Luther's small catechism is going to answer for us these questions. Who am I as characters? Why am I here as our purpose? What's wrong with the world as the problem that we face? And the solutions that we encounter that bring us back to good. Um, so let's take a look at that first little flow chart here. We have the Ten Commandments, the Creed, and the Lord's Prayer. And these all blend together really nicely to give us a picture of the Christian worldview. So under the Ten Commandments, answering the question, who am I and why am I here? For the Ten Commandments, we would say, well, I am created to fear, love, and trust in God above all things. The first three commandments are all about God. So who am I and why am I here? I'm here to fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Uh, another catechism put out by our Presbyterian friends is called the Westminster Shorter Catechism. And they would say, what is the chief end of man? In other words, what does it mean to be human and why are we here? They would say, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. I think that Luther's small catechism is really kind of aiming the same way, to fear, love, and trust in God above all things. God's at the center and everything revolves around him. Now, the rest of the commandments are about your neighbor. Commandments 4 through 10 are about how you live in relationship with other people. And so we would say that I am created to serve my neighbor. That is why you exist, to serve your neighbor. That's why someday you will have a job. That is why you are part of a family. That is why you go to school. That is why you exist, is to serve your neighbor. Now, contrast that, of course, to the moralistic therapeutic deism worldview, where I'm here just to be happy and feel good about myself. Now, as we look at the creed, the creed teaches us who God is. The commandments show us a little bit about who God is, his rules, his commandments, his nature. But it's in the creed, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that we're going to get the real depth of who God is in his person. So uh, the creed tells me, who am I? Why am I here? It tells me that I am created by God. We say in the first article of the creed, which we'll speak today in church, he made me and all creatures. So who am I? I'm a creature of God. And furthermore, for those who are Christians, we would say that I am God's child, part of his family. In the second article of the Creed about Jesus, we say, that I may be his own. Now, we haven't talked a lot about the Lord's Prayer, but the Lord's Prayer is, is a great description of the Christian worldview. Because the Lord's Prayer is asking God that the worldview would be done on earth. So, according to the Lord's Prayer, who am I and why am I here? Well, I am God's child, because we pray, our Father... To say our Father implies that God is our Father and we are his children. And then next, we are part of God's kingdom when we pray, thy kingdom come. So do you see all the purpose and all the meaning here? I mean, to, to live according to the Christian worldview is to have deep purpose and deep meaning. In fact, I would argue that as a Christian, there's never a boring moment in your life. If you would really pause and think, everything is interesting. I mean, even a blade of grass is interesting as Christians because God made it. It's all for his glory. Let's, let's move on and let's look at those second two questions. What's the problem or the solution? So from the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments diagnose our problem. The Catechism never talks about humanity's fall into sin. We never hear anything about Adam and Eve and the first sin. But the Ten Commandments are like a good doctor. They're going to diagnose our problem. So according to the Ten Commandments, our problem is idolatry, that we fear, love, and trust in created things rather than the Creator. So remember, we're here to fear, love, and trust in God, but our problem is that we don't live out that identity. We don't fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And the problem is revealed, but in the Ten Commandments, the solution is given. So I would put it this way. The Ten Commandments, good as they are, are a lead life vest. Can you imagine wearing a life vest made out of lead? You're going straight down. 
Commandments, they tell you what's wrong, but they don't heal you. They tell you what to do, but they don't give you the power to do it. All they do is diagnose a problem. In order to get a solution, we got to move to the creed. In fact, Luther says this. He says that, um, that once we learn what we should do and what we should not do in the Ten Commandments, we must then move to the creed to find the medicine, to find how we are able to do what God has commanded us to do. So the creed tells me that I'm a lost and condemned person. That's not good news. That's a problem. But the creed also tells me that Jesus Christ has redeemed me, literally bought me back, and that the Holy Spirit has called me and created faith in me. So that's the solution. We have a problem, we have a solution. And then in the Lord's Prayer, we pray, Thy kingdom come. That is the ultimate solution to all the problems in this world, is that God's kingdom would come. We pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive, and we pray, deliver us from evil. So there's the solution. Um, we've experienced it in part as we've been converted to the faith, but we will experience it in full when Christ returns. It's kind of like right now we have the appetizers, but the full course is when Jesus returns. So does everybody see um, how the Christian worldview is a story? How all the pieces fit together? Now, in the time we have remaining... Um, there's a final exercise here. We're not going to have time to do this, but I want you to do it. Please do it, um, especially if you're watching online. Make sure that you, you take some time to do this. On the last page, what I want you to do is, is you, you have these three scenarios, and I want you to imagine writing a letter of thanks or a letter of condolence or sympathy, depending on your worldview. So look at number one. You have experienced the birth of your first child. You are overwhelmed with joy. Who do you thank and what do you say? Imagine that you're from the secular worldview or the moralistic therapeutic deism worldview. Who would you thank for the gift of new life? Uh, number two, a friend suffering from severe depression is seriously con contemplating suicide. So imagine that you are secular or moralistic therapeutic deism worldview. What do you say to convince her that she is valuable and that life is worth living? And then number three, a friend has lost his wife to cancer one year after getting married. What do you say to offer hope? So the, I want you to try this. Just try later this afternoon. How would you write a note of condolence or sympathy or a note of thanks based on these situations? I mean, as, as Christians, we would have a way of addressing these things. We would talk about you're loved by God. God has a purpose for you. Jesus loves you. He gave his son for you. There will be an end to suffering. But how would you comfort somebody or give thanks based on secularism or moralistic therapeutic deism? So we don't have time to do that uh, in the class, but uh, if you're watching online or as you go home today, make sure that you give this a try. Uh, what I want to do now is I want to break into groups here. Let's do three groups. Um, how about uh, you three want to work together, you guys want to work together, and you guys want to work together. Who wants to be moralistic therapeutic deism because they just feel... Like they want to be happy and feel good about themselves. You do? Okay. You guys can be a moralistic therapeutic deism. How about you guys both be secularism? What we're going to do is each of you are going to get one of these little posters here. And we have the four worldview questions here. And according to your worldview, uh, go ahead and answer. Pretend like you are writing a movie about your worldview. So if you're writing a, a movie about your worldview, and your movie is called Moralistic Therapeutic Deism, the sequel, or whatever you want to call it, um, you, can, you, can, you want to ask, who am I? Who are the characters? Who am I? How would the characters answer that question? Why am I here? How would your characters answer that? Uh, what's the problem? And then also, what's the solution? And then if you'd like to, please come up with a movie title. If you could give Moralistic Therapeutic Deism a movie title, what would it be? You two uh, groups are going to be secularism. And you can come up with a movie title for secularism as well. Uh, once again, answer those basic questions. Um, those basic questions of worldview. If you have any questions along the way, just let me know. I'll take maybe about 10 minutes. 
If you're watching online, I'm not going to stop the video. What you can do is just pause it, and when I send you the email, I will tell you in the email where to pick it up again. Uh, seriously. Oh, thank you. Actually, the truth is we're, we're actually done. We're not doing the last video or the last activity. So, so we could probably go ahead and end. So thank you.